Well, we welcome everybody to this first class. We're glad you could join us. I don't know who may come in later or whatever, but uh, we're glad that you're here. I know it's a little different class than what most of us have, have joined in in the study of things pertaining to God. We're going to actually study God if we can. And uh, if we think of the word theology and you hear around nowadays, then literally it's, it's like biology or geology. Uh, theology means uh, the study of God. Now, theology nowadays tends to be connected with uh, various uh, schools of religion of some sort or the other. And it means usually they're in the school of theology and they're trying to get uh, studies, uh, at least among denominational folks, of uh, some sort of uh, ordination papers or higher degree or whatever. Uh, theologians in general, over the years, while claiming to be the friend of God, have many times been God's worst enemy as far as what's revealed in the Bible, like they have in so many things concerning just exactly what the Bible teaches. But in the strict sense of, of being a theist, um, theos, meaning God, and the study of God, certainly that's the thing that we ought to do. Now, it, this is not going to be a class that's in the area of apologetics. Apologetics deals with the proofs for the existence of God, refuting those things that people offer to say he doesn't exist, or the proofs of the deity of Christ or the proofs of the plenary verbal inspiration of scriptures. We're not doing that. Uh, we're assuming that those in this class believe in God, believe in the God of the Bible, uh, believe that he exists. And in most cases, most of you believe that you're uh, children of God. Now, that means you know considerable about a number of things concerning God. And the other thing I would mention, though, usually the things that we study have to do with the third person of Godhead. We'll talk more about the Trinity later on, but right now, the Holy Spirit. I have, I don't know how many books I've accumulated over the years on the Holy Spirit. There's no way to properly study the Holy Spirit, not know something about God because he is God and thus you have to do that but we've studied the Holy Spirit primarily in refuting what Calvinism has taught about his direct work on people to convert them because the straight-laced Calvinist doesn't believe that a person can respond on his own to anything the Bible teaches he believes he must be approached by God through the Spirit and all that. We won't go into all that. But in the process of learning what the Bible says on the Holy Spirit, there have been a lot of studies on that. That is the Holy Spirit in conviction. How does he convict the sinner? Conversion. Um, and, of course, then sanctification. We study the Holy Spirit on those lines. The indwelling of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, and so on. And inspiration itself. Uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration is from a Greek word, theophanoustos, a compound word. It means outbreathe from God. You can hear the two words involved there. But so we studied it from that standpoint. But just simply to say we sat in many classes over the years, uh, there have been a lot of books written, even by our brethren, that deal strictly with the study of God. There's not that many. Um, so most all, even of my books, though, I have quite a few that deal with the uh, study of God. Uh, most of them, even then, have been about the Holy Spirit. Um, some of the older works, by older, I mean 700 years old, coming out of the Reformation, before the Lord's Church, as far as history is concerned, was even restored. Many of those people, because they were such believers and devoted to the Bible as the Word of God had some good things to say, and they did some in-depth studies of God. And um, you still must be very careful of Calvinism uh, because it will bleed over. It's like using any denominational commentary. It's good to know the background uh, religion of the person who wrote it. If he depends upon his scholarship, then that's one thing. But if he begins to let his particular church doctrine bleed over into his study, 
then there's another thing. So that's always the problem of dealing with denominational works. And uh, we may say more about those things as time goes on, but we are not, uh, we're not again involved in apologetics this time. We're trying to see what is revealed about God. Now, let me emphasize this part in our orientation. Uh, we cannot completely define God. There's a very simple reason for that, because we cannot completely understand God. Uh, we've got to keep that in mind. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, we can't have any knowledge. The Bible itself is revealed from God for the good of man, the enlightenment of man, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. It just simply means there are those things that, first of all, our mind can't comprehend of God. And um, it takes, it's like anything else in being a Christian. You have to grow. Most of the New Testament's designed for the Christian. So he can grow, and by growing, not apostatize. So in coming, coming to a proper knowledge of God, then we have to realize our conception of God is limited. So we can't know because we're finite, we're limited. We can't know because of God being God and he's beyond us. Remember, he's not a man. We're going to emphasize all the way through. If you try to start thinking of God as a man, you immediately open yourself up for error regarding God. Um, what we are saying is that our concept of God is limited to the two things, the natural revelation, what used to be called natural um, religion, natural science, things in nature, what's talked about. In fact, Romans 1 that was studied last week in our midweek Bible study with Ken, uh, it would be a good one to go to. and We may refer to it sometimes as to what Paul was saying concerning people and their knowledge of God, because you'll remember those of you that were in the class, how we noted that Paul said that they desired not to retain God in their knowledge. So uh, they knew something of God and they desired to give him up and thus God gave them up. So there's things we can know, things we can't know. It's also good to keep in mind Deuteronomy 29, 29 on anything you study. I just simply says, you can best know God by his revelation in his word, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. But um, the secret things belong to God. The things that are revealed unto us and our children forever. We're interested in things revealed, whether it be natural revelation that we often consult in proving the existence of God, such as um, the cosmos, any, any argument based on the cosmos showing design, let's say, there's a design, there's a designer. So, uh, and a designer who's capable and powerful enough to carry out what it would take to make such a thing as, as this. Um, I was over several years ago, there was one time that Ken went to London and we were in the uh, uh, natural, I believe it was the Natural Science Museum. It may have been the, um, oh, the other one that's a British Museum. I think it's kind of, I believe it's a British Museum because uh, King George III was quite a learning person and he had all kinds of things pertaining to science. And I was away from Ken. I don't know whether Jody was with me or not, but, but he had made out of brass uh, a whole uh, setup for our solar system the sun at the center, all the stars, or rather all the planets, circling it. And uh, I called Ken down there, and I said, I want to show you something. I want you to look at something that just out of millions and millions and millions of years accidentally happened. And I pointed to that thing, which obviously I would look at that and say, it evidence is designed, and evidence is somebody that's able to come up with that and copy it from the universe take uh, what is the real thing and put it there. Some man had to have the ability to do that. But uh, when it comes then to God, we don't allow there to be a God behind the real genuine article of the cosmos. So that's how we tend to deal with things like that. Uh, but we are finite. Uh, I would say the greatest thing I can emphasize any one of us regarding study of God 
is that we're finite. And the other thing is this. The Bible is primarily interested in saving our soul from sin. Thus, it's God's will presented on your level of mind so that we can understand the design and purpose of life in the flesh on this earth, where we came from, what we're here for, where we're going, to the point of where we can find God and understanding how he saves us through Jesus Christ of the gospel. Now, how God might reveal himself, if such is the case, notice the ifs there. After this whole system is over and done with, and heaven is our home and we're in glorified bodies, how we can understand God then may be completely different, or at least a lot different from the way God has revealed himself now because he's aiming at our salvation. Let's keep that in mind when we study the Bible. The Bible is a revealed mind of God teaching us that God saves us through Jesus Christ, his son, by the gospel, to his glory and to his honor. That basically sums up the design and purpose of the Bible. And in the process of doing all of that, he has revealed a great many things. There are a lot of things that we can learn, and you've heard me, some of you have, most of you, that are not explicitly stated. One of the things about logic is that it will... Um, it will expand your knowledge. Now, I'm going to fall back on those that have heard me teach before about implications. But my old illustration in Saul of Tarsus, I can firmly state and I can prove that Saul of Tarsus, in the process of becoming a Christian, repented of his sins. Saul of Tarsus, in the process of becoming a Christian, repented of his sins. Now, you can look all you want to look, and so you should. Uh, to see where that is in just so many words that is explicitly stated, you can't find it because it's not. Well, then how can any of us be so sure that Saul of Tarsus, in the process of becoming a Christian, repented of his sin? Well, this is where we should be familiar enough with it to understand that in the plan of salvation, one of the steps after belief is repentance of sins, Acts 17, 30. Thus, if anybody becomes a Christian, they must repent of their sins. Again, Acts 17, 30, Luke 13, 3, Luke 13, 5. Now, did Saul of Tarsus become a Christian? Yes, he did. What's implied by that? He had to repent of his sin. So I can explicitly state what the Bible does. not While the Bible does not say that Saul of Tarsus in just, uh, what does not say that he repented of his sin in the process of becoming a Christian, I know that he did because you can't become a Christian without repenting of your sins, and he became a Christian. So there's a lot of things like that in studying the explicit statements of the Bible concerning God that will help us to understand some things about God. So one can extend his knowledge about things through proper reasoning, and we're taught prove all things, hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. A part of studying the Bible and writing the divine word of truth demands that we learn that principle of Bible study. And Isaiah himself said, come let, on behalf of God to Israel, said, come let us reason together. Well, uh, when you preach the gospel like it ought to be, or when you teach any lesson like it ought to be concerning God, Christian life, whatever, it appeals to man's reasoning power. So, one of the things we noticed immediately is that while we're limited, we're finite, God created us. And when he communicates with us, he doesn't bypass the way he created us to communicate. So we have a Bible, we have words, signs of ideas, vehicles of thought. These are God's thoughts put into signs. And when we read those, we can understand them. And that's how understanding comes. So we must realize in our understanding of God, is dependent upon revelation, whether it is special revelation in the words of the Bible or whether it's natural revelation. And even with that, we can only know so much because of the limited revelation or the fact we can't understand certain things because we're not capable. You don't sit with a six-month-old baby and 
teach him uh, multiplication tables and expect him to learn them. Why? Because he's an idiot? No, because, not necessarily, <laughs> but because the child's not mature enough, not capable enough at that age to grasp such things. Well, so are we. We are, as human beings, the way God made us, we cannot find ourselves capable of understanding some things, yet we're assured in the Bible we can understand what we need to understand. And we're commanded to keep on studying. As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A word with that it is not to be ashamed, rightly divine word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. And on and on you can go about studying the scriptures. Now, concerning our particular concept of God, I hope we can see then, therefore, it is limited. And um, we need to understand further that when you open your Bible, it doesn't say, now, uh, I'm going to prove to you the existence of God. It doesn't say that at all, does it? It assumes that the people know God exists. Well, we are interested. In our study, as I've said several times already, not of proving the existence of God, but we're learning about God. When you read Genesis 1 and uh, verse 1, in the beginning, God created. And it says, in the beginning, God, do you ever say, what is this God? See, most of us don't because we've been raised in a culture and an atmosphere where we just accept that as God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, as it's taught in the Bible, the same thing we do with Jesus. And yet there's a lot of error out there on God. We don't have, to, we won't in this class have to say, and I understand when it says in the beginning, God, he's not talking about uh, the idolatrous worship of Moloch. He's not talking about Baal worship. He's not talking about those gods or Zeus or somebody like that. We know better. Our minds, when we read, we say Moses, inspired of the Holy Spirit, wrote in the beginning God. But we are interested in noticing just exactly what is God or who is God. Now, a question, have you ever asked that? In the beginning God, well, let's stop there. Who is God? And more than that, what is God? In fact, the very word, capital G-O-D in English, what does it mean? What does it mean? Well, let's look for a little bit along these lines, and there will be, I'm sure as time goes on, questions asked, and we'll be repeating ourselves. This is all introductory, and uh, if you don't understand some of that, we'll write your question down. We'll go back over it. I'm just trying to lay groundwork to really get into the study. I want to talk about what we can call God's essence. E S S E N C E, God's essence. Now, actually, when you understand the essence of God, you're being redundant to say God's essence. And I think you'll see why in a little bit. This word, essence, is derived from the Latin infinitive. S-A, E-S-S-E. You can find a lot of things to answer many of the questions when you have word studies, and you look up the origin of the words and see that they develop, or see how they develop. That's, that's really interesting to do that. And I'm not just talking about the Bible, especially the Bible, for obvious reasons, but that works with a lot of things. Now, this word originally in the Latin, means to be, to be. It speaks then of what a thing is, the essence of a thing. To speak of God's essence, therefore, is to speak of what? or who God is. Now, God is his essence. That really helps you, doesn't it? <laughs> God is. God is God. God is. 
is essence. You are, as a human being, though created by God, you have your own essence. To speak of God's essence is to actually, or to speak of human, a human's essence. But in the case of God, is, is actually to seek to delineate God's intrinsic state of existence or being. You know you're not God. I'm using this to illustrate. You know already that the Bible, the revealed mind of God coming from God, says that God didn't have a beginning or an ending. When Moses, the burning bush, if you go up there and see why it wasn't consumed, in speaking to God, he wanted to know the name of God before he went back to Pharaoh and did the things finally that God got him to do. And you know what he said. Tell him, I am has sent you. I am that I am. Yeah. Now, we're talking about something that's not bothered by time, has nothing to do with time. We're talking about the essence of God that separates him from everything else. God exists, but what is it that exists? Because God exists. Let me say it again. God exists, but what is it that exists? Because God exists. So God can be spoken of as being itself. But I ask this question. To say being means that I have to say what be. Now, this is just showing you, and I wanted to do it at the very beginning, that when you start really using that mind that God gave you with trying to understand God, you get above man immediately. We're created beings. But even though the scripture says we're created in the image of God, we may talk about that later, uh, doesn't mean that we didn't, that we're eternal. We had a beginning. God doesn't have a beginning. He's I am. And when we speak then of the essence of God, we're talking about what he is, and he's not created, and because we have revelation, this special revelation in words delivered to us for the purpose of enlightening us, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, it doesn't mean that he's revealed everything. The secret things belong to God. That implies immediately that he didn't reveal everything or a lot of things. You realize that, Deuteronomy 29, 29. We usually quote that to try to say, we stick with the Bible. Well, that's true. But in trying to understand the essence of God, the being of God, it's also telling us that all you have to go on, and that's plenty, is that the general revelation of nature and in the special revelation of the words of God, well, we usually are thinking about how to become a Christian, steps in the plan of salvation, the church, its work, its worship, et cetera, et cetera. But now we're applying that same truth to the very existence of God and trying to understand God himself. And you might raise this question and hold it. <laughs> We'll get to it later on. Notice I said God himself. Now, you will notice throughout Scripture that as God refers to himself, he takes the masculine gender. Does that mean God is a man? No. But there's some obvious reasons we can get into later on. You remember when Jesus is with the apostles telling them that he must go away when they don't really understand all about what the Messiah had to do and dying and leaving, going to heaven. And he's telling them about the Holy Spirit to come. You ever notice how he said it? He said, how be it when he shall come, he shall guide you and Donald Prue. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall speak. You ever wonder why? Why the Holy Spirit himself inspiring John to write what Jesus said, and then Jesus said it originally. Why do you use the word he since God's not a human? 
that gets rather interesting. Maybe that'll whet your appetite when we get to that point. Uh, because we've heard a lot of the women's livers say, ah, oh, you say amen, and then they make a big do about that, say, why can't we say a women? Why do you call God God why can't, and say him, and why can't you call her her? Well, you know, God doesn't just do anything without a reason. And it would do us well to consider that later on. But those are just some of the things that we can read over time and time again, and yet miss some questions that ought to be raised about those particular things. Um, so to speak of God's ex essence is actually to discuss God. And that's what we're doing in this course. To speak of his essence, to speak of his being, is actually to discuss God. Now, when you see deity, the word deity, one deity, one God, and we'll make it clear later why we chose to call them class, uh, Godhead class. But right now, uh, we'll just say God. God, and we use the word deity. Deity literally means one divine essence. And let's get that in our head now. There's only one eternal divine essence. There is no other. One divine essence. Now, you may already be thinking, yeah, but there's first, second, third person to Godhead. Of course, there are people who believe in God, believe in Christ. They do not believe there are three persons in one. Now, we're getting to an area, I assure you, that uh, has a mystery to it. Not a mystery like who killed Aunt Sally in the library. Not that kind of mystery. It means unrevealed. There's a mystery to understanding God, understanding deity, understanding the divine essence, and that there are three persons who possess that one divine essence. And each one of them, as you read the scriptures, are called God. That is, they all possess the divine essence. Now, you can remember um, Jesus saying, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That ought to raise questions. What in the world did he mean? Because there's three persons. How does he say, you see me, you see the Father? He's certainly not talking about the fleshly body he was in. So that does raise the question of how? Well, it's because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all have the one singular divine essence without beginning or ending. And they're the only ones that do. Now, there's a lot about that we don't understand, and we're not going to understand it. We spend the next five years in this class every day. We may understand a lot more than we do now, but uh, it's going to be quite difficult to grasp some of those things. Remember, it was Paul who told Timothy, great is the mystery of godliness. And the Holy Spirit had Paul write that. That was the Holy Spirit saying that. Great is the mystery of godliness. So we have to be content with the things revealed, whether it be a natural theology, that is, in, the, in nature, or whether it be in special revelation, the Word of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Uh, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. So let's keep those points in mind. Um, so while God can be discussed, he cannot be defined. Not fully. Because to define God is to limit God. Now think about that for a minute. To define something is to limit it. What is the very purpose of choosing terms to describe things but to limit them? See, they separate. When you define a term, it separates itself then from everything else. That's the whole purpose of it. If I say, Barry then that gives you one idea. You don't know what I'm talking about bearing, but you look up the meaning of bearing and know it does not uh, mean thrown up in the air. So when you define, you're getting understanding on the basis of it zeroes in on that one thing and the qualities of that one thing that make it stand out. When, if if uh, people, and that happens every day throughout the United States and the world, People go missing. Well, they start immediately to try to come up with everything in the world that sets that person, that person apart from all the other billions of people on this earth so they can identify. Pictures, fingerprints, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
so that it will stand out. So you've limited when you do that. And you can't do that with God. So it means that we're understanding God as he's revealed himself. And the closest we can understand him is going to be in his word. You can only go so far with uh, natural theology or, or what's revealed in nature. Um, I don't know how to say that any better than what I just did. And that's the reason I paused to see if I can say it in another way. Uh, once a definition is given, then the then God, the biblical God, the God who reveals himself in the Bible, must be said to be greater than the definition. Why? Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to God. The things revealed to us and our children forever. And since he himself explicitly said in just so many words through the Holy Spirit by Paul to Timothy, great is the mystery of godliness, then it's obvious he expects us to understand that even though we can define him as best we can and try to understand him with all the mental powers we have and honesty we possess and studious ability we employ in the studying of the Bible, uh, we've got to understand we'll never reach there. I had a fellow one time say, ask the question, uh, are you telling about somebody that asked the question? Um, how does God exist eternally without beginning or ending? Well, when you start thinking about that, your mind goes cuckoo because it doesn't know anything except begin and end as far as the way things work here. When you start trying to figure out, you mean no beginning? That's right. Great I am, no beginning. That's why he said I am. So fellow fellow gets to heaven, he's, and he's trying to illustrate just what a mystery uh, what how, how great God is, even in a glorified state in heaven, far beyond what we are now. Then somebody said, uh, can you explain to me now how it is that you just have always been, that you always have been I am, no beginning or end? And let's just suppose for a minute that he explains it to him. And the statement was, well, after he got through because of the difficulty of the matter, the fellow says back to God, would you mind going over that one more time? <laughs> so we're to, we've got to recognize that fact about God, that however much we know, uh, and there is more that we can know, however much we know, we, we're still limited. So once a definition is given of the God revealed himself in the Bible to us for our information, we, we automatically know. He's not limited by that definition. He's greater than that definition. Uh, for the essence of God cannot be uh, encapsulated in a sentence or a paragraph. Discussion of God is certainly permissible and right because of studying the Bible, we come across these things about God. But a full definition is just impossible. And what is said about God will be true if it is consistent with revelation. In other words, you can't draw conclusions or state things about God when it goes diametrically against what the Bible says, because that's God speaking. Who wrote the Bible? I'm not talking about the handwriter or the man whose hand wrote it. Who wrote the Bible? All scriptures given by inspiration of God. God wrote the Bible. So if I come to a conclusion about the essence of God or the oneness of God that goes against some part of the Bible, I've come to the wrong conclusion. Back up and start again. That's very important and a good rule of Bible study on anything. Uh, I think of that when it comes to the book of Revelation. You don't study the book of Revelation like you do the other books in the New Testament because it's symbolic. It's uh, full of imagery. It has a special language called apocalyptic language. It was meant to hide some, hide things from some and reveal to others. So if I come to a conclusion from something in the book of Revelation that goes diametrically opposed to the plain language of the scripture, then I come to the wrong conclusion. 
because it's not going to teach the revelation in symbolic language, what's not taught in plain language elsewhere. That's a very important point. Same thing's true when we're talking about God. We must understand that. So whatever affirmations that we find that are true never exhaust the infinite God it has no beginning or ending, and he indwells eternity. Now, let me say here, uh, J.D., you be sure and kept, watch me on my time because I'm trying to watch, but I get things going on my mind, and sometimes I don't catch the exact time. But um, it's, 7, it's 7.40 right now, so you have about five minutes. Okay. Um, what I want to do when we speak of God's essence, I only have about five minutes. Uh, next week, then, we will just simply look at John 4, 24. God is spirit. John 4, 24. Because uh, when we say God is spirit, then we're talking about the essence of God. And that's what we've introduced. The being of God is spirit. The being of God is spirit. He's a divine being. We are human beings. And so you're speaking of the human essence. What makes you a human? Why is it your dog or cat a human being? And what's the difference? You can't say they don't have being. You have pet that being on the head sometimes. Uh, unless maybe your wives did that to your husband. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Human beings, divine beings, human beings created by the divine being who has no creator. He always was, always is. He is the I am. He is the eternal being. So we have to think about inhabiting eternity. That is, there's no end to that. There wasn't a beginning to it. There's no end to it. That gets rather interesting to me. So uh, this being that's eternal is spirit. And let me say this about John 4, 24. In your Bibles, it will say God is a spirit. You notice that in John 4, 24? Because in the discussion with the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, they're talking about worship. And of course, he lived and died under the Mosaic system, and that was the way that they approached God. And she's a Samaritan, so Jesus tells her right up front, salvation is on the Jews. We know what we worship. You don't. He didn't put any punches on that line. But you'll notice if you look at it, that it doesn't say God is a spirit. It says God is spirit. He is the one singular divine essence. He is the one being without beginning or ending. As far as apologetics is concerned, you reduced immediately back to either there is one divine mind that existed without beginning or ending that created all things, or else you're forced to say matter is eternal. And uh, you can't do that. It won't work. Even atheists aren't really wanting to hold too close to the idea that matter is eternal. They have studied too much and determined there was a beginning. If there was a beginning, there had to be somebody at the beginning. So in that sense, uh, any of this could connect to apologetics and to proving the existence of God. But when you think of God, you're thinking of a pure spirit, God is love. And now that brings up this later. We will talk about how do we know this essence? Well, that essence produces a nature, just like your human essence produces a nature. We call it human nature. And we have our attributes. Well, we will get into pretty quick the study of the divine attributes. Where do those attributes come from? They come from the one divine essence, the one being of God. So if we really, probably the best knowledge we can get of God is through his divine attributes. Understanding of the fact that he didn't begin and does not end and he always has been, that is very difficult. And nobody can 
get that really. Our minds just kind of ricochet off the wall when we try to get them around the idea of not beginning to read them. And he inhabits eternity. God is as much right now on the moon or in the farthest star of the universe as he is here. Because he inhabits eternity. Where time come from? Well, he created time. He created everything. It's not him. In the material world, as well as the world of spiritual things, the non-material, or as they call it philosophy, the metaphysical. And I may use metaphysical quite a bit referring to spiritual things because sometimes when you talk about spiritual things, I don't know what people mean by spiritual. I hear somebody say of somebody, oh, he's so spiritual. What do you mean? Uh, you smile pretty, you smell good. What, how do you know somebody's spiritual? Uh, that is a good question. How do you know? Part of that somewhere else. Ask yourself, am I a spiritual person? Or the New Testament describes the person. How do you know you are? Jesus said, by their fruit, you shall know them. What kind of fruit do I bear to prove to me that I'm a spiritual person because I'm told to examine myself, see whether I'm in faith? Well, when I try to understand that, um, it's interesting. Well, we're just about to 745 by my clock. Does that sound right or I go over? It's 745. Okay. Uh, any questions anybody has? We still have 15 minutes.